following videos will illustrate the techniques used in Module 4, Protein Biochemistry. The characterization of proteins are essential in many aspects of medical research, where the expression of a variant or mutant form of a protein, or the underexpression of a necessary level of a protein, often underlies the cause of many diseases. In this module, you will work on both the isolation and purification of a representative protein of your choosing. Proteins are universally important because they are the structural components of cells. In addition, they are the enzymes that carry out the metabolic and growth properties of cells as well. Finally, there are proteins that regulate the growth and proliferation of cells and cell function. The isolation of proteins can occur from several different approaches. The first approach is often to dissociate cells from a piece of tissue, be that from an experimental animal or from a surgical biopsy and proteins are then extracted from those cells. The second approach is to grow cells in culture that represent the cell of interest, and those cultured cells are disrupted and the proteins are extracted. The third approach is using bacterial systems where a protein of interest has been cloned into that bacteria and the bacteria express that protein, and then proteins are isolated from the bacterial system. In module four, you will be using the bacterial expression system the lice to extract your proteins. Thank you. In this activity, we will be using affinity purification to separate our fluorescent protein out from the other bacterial protein contaminants. Affinity purification separates proteins based on specific binding interactions between the protein of interest and another substrate, which is usually amino acid sequences. These are called affinity tags, and they're added to the recombinant protein of interest. We'll be using a 6X histidine tag, which is six histidine amino acids added to one end of our protein. Histidine is used because it has a high affinity for the nickel ions that are in the affinity column. When the solution passes through the affinity column, the his tag binds to the nickel, and therefore so does our target protein because it's attached to the his tag. But the non-specific proteins that don't have the tag and don't bind to the column just flow through. Finally, during the elution, the elution buffer is added, which outcompetes um, the his tag and takes the spot of it, releasing the his tag and the target protein. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add two milliliters of the lysis buffer to our bacterial pellet. The lysis buffer is a soap used to break up the cell wall and it contains the enzyme lysosome, which degrades the bacterial cell wall. So just take up your two milliliters. And then you're just gonna put it into your bacterial pellet. Like that. Okay, and then next we're gonna pipette it just up and down. So just take as much as you can up and just back down to kind of mix it. So kind of shake it a little. All right, and then you just want to keep doing this until there's no cell clumps left. So. Okay. And you can see there's no more cell clumps. So now, we're gonna wait 15 minutes for the lysis buffer to lyse the bacterial cells. And you can kind of gently mix it sometimes um, to help facilitate the lysis process. Okay. All right, so after 15 minutes, we're just gonna take up um, one microliter, or one milliliter of the solution and put it into one tube. And then after that, we're gonna take up another milliliter and put it in the other tube like all right and then you're going to centrifuge um, your cell lysate at like a maximum rpm for five minutes and then you'll see a sticky pellet at the bottom and then a 
brightly colored transparent supernatant on top. Alright, so after you take your Eppendorf tubes out of the centrifuge, you can clearly see that there's the bacterial cell pellet at the bottom, which is made up of all the insoluble cell debris, like the bacterial cell wall and membrane. And then you can see the clear fluorescent looking supernatant, um, which is brightly colored and mostly transparent, indicating that the lysis and centrifugation process was carried out correctly. So now we're gonna take up 200 microliters of one of the supernatants. So you wanna be careful when you're doing this to just get the supernatant and not to disturb the bacterial pellet. And then you wanna put that into another tube, which is labeled total cell lysate and you want to save that. So after you've taken your sample of the total cell lysate, you're going to get a syringe, which will be given to you, and one of these um, lure lock filters. So the syringe is a lure lock syringe, and that just means that when you take the cap off like that, you can see that there's kind of like a twist where we can put other stuff in. So the first thing you want to do is take out the plunger from the syringe and then we're going to screw the filter onto the syringe. So once you have your filter screwed on, we're going to take our two Eppendorf tubes with our samples that we just centrifuged and then what you want to do is take up as much of the supernatant as you can and put it into the open syringe and then you want to do that over the 10 microliter um, test tube that you have and then we're just going to push down and filter the flow through through it. So I'm going to do that really quick and then I'll be back um, after it's been filtered. Okay. Alright, so once you've added all of the supernatant to the syringe, you can go ahead and put the plunger in and then you just want to push down until it's all gone through. Alright, and then next up we're going to use the affinity column to filter it more. So when we do the affinity column procedure, you're going to be given the affinity column. It looks like this, and they are very expensive, so please don't throw them away or any of the plastic adapters that come with it. And you also want to make sure that you don't push air into the column. So all that means is don't ever let the um, syringe go to the point where there's no liquid in it. There should always be a little bit of liquid to avoid pushing air into the column. So when you get your affinity column, you can see that it comes with a like, lid for storage. So now you're going to put on the syringe adapter. And then you can see that this also has the um, lure lock in it. Okay, and then, so you just wanna twist on the syringe. All right, so then you're gonna take up five milliliters of wash buffer two. And you wanna use the serological pipette for this. And then you're just going to put that into the syringe. And you want to make sure when you put it into the syringe that everything's put on. And then you're going to put your plunger in after adding the liquid. So then just into an empty beaker, you just want to push the wash buffer through the column. 
then you want to keep doing that until all the liquid is gone. Alright, so then you want to stop pushing the liquid through when you have about half a milliliter left in your syringe. So then you want to unscrew the syringe and you always want to make sure that you unscrew the syringe before you take the plunger out because you want to avoid sucking out with the plunger from the column. So then you're going to take out your plunger and then twist back on the affinity column. And then we are going to take our filtered supernatant from earlier and then we're going to transfer that into the syringe next and then you want to do this over an open tube that you can label um, flow through. All right, so depending on how much you have you can use whichever type of pipette fits best. We didn't have a lot so I'm just going to use a P1000 but you're just going to take that all up and then you want to do this over your flow through so then you're going to add it to the syringe like that and then now you can push your plunger in and then you just want to filter all that into an Eppendorf tube that you're going to keep labeled flow through. Okay. And you want to make sure that you stop before you run out of liquid. And once you have collected your flow through, you should see the fluorescent protein kind of um, immobilizing on the column now. You can just kind of see it in this one towards the top, but you'll see like a bright clear band. All right, so then after that, you wanna wash the column again with five more milliliters of your um, wash buffer. So then twist the syringe back on again. And you wanna collect this flow through as well because it's just good practice to collect everything. So now we're gonna take up, using the serological pipette, five milliliters of the wash buffer, which is the same one that we used earlier. And not, none of the fluorescent protein should um, come off the column when we're washing it, but the, um, it should wash out any like non-specific bacterial proteins that may still be in it. So we're gonna take up another five milliliters okay. and then add it to the syringe and then you're just going to push your plunger back in again all right and then you just want to push through the wash buffer again until you have only half a milliliter left. Alright, so as you can see, after you've put the wash buffer through for the second time, it will be a nice clear liquid indicating that none of your fluorescent protein came out when you washed it. Alright, so you're going to want to set out a few five or six um, Eppendorf tubes labeled one through five, and then we're going to do the fluorescent protein elution. All right, so you should have your six or five Eppendorf tubes and you just wanna place them in a test rack and open them all up because what we're gonna be doing next is we're going to add five milliliters of our elution buffer into the syringe and push that through the column. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna to start to see the fluorescent band moving down the column and then eventually into the tubes. So you're just gonna start from one tube and then add about half a milliliter and then go straight to the next tube and then keep going through all the tubes so some people might need more or less tubes depending on how much you have but 
Alright, so. So, with the serological pipette, we're going to take out 5 milliliters of the elution buffer. And then you just want to put that into the syringe. And then you can put plunger in. And then you can see I have half a milliliter labeled, which is a good amount to put in each tube. And so you just want to continue going. Until you fill all your tubes. So as you can see, after putting the um, elution buffer through the tubes, um, you can see that the first tube is pretty clear, while the second one is brighter, and then it gets less bright, less bright until it eventually goes back to clear. And you can tell that that's because the band was like here, so it had to move down. So as it was moving down, like it hadn't come out yet. And then once it got to the bottom, the fluorescent protein came out, which is in that tube. And then a little bit more of it came out, and then eventually it got to the point past where the fluorescent protein was, and it turned clear again. Alright, so then you're going to put your samples in a tube rack and place them in the cold room. And you want to make sure that... You're also going to run once more five milliliters of the wash buffer through um, the column one more time just to clean it. And then you can switch it back to its storage lid and then give it to an instructor. And again, the columns are really expensive, so please don't throw anything away. All right, so once you're done, you're gonna arrange all of your fractions in order on the UV light box. And then you wanna make sure you put the UV light shield on and then you can turn it on to visualize your fractions and as you can see they're all different levels of intensity and the intensity of this fluorescence indicates the relative concentration of protein in each of your fractions and then next you're going to be loading those fractions into a gel for further analysis after the gel has run for approximately half an hour turn the main power pack off and remove the electrodes we will evaluate the gel based on the migrations of the dyes. If you look, you can see a blue dye that has moved down the gel. That's a small molecular weight dye that indicates where the relative protein migration has occurred. The second way you can evaluate the gel is by looking at the ladder of pre-stained markers on the left that are shown in this figure, that you can determine how well the proteins have spread out and moved through the gel. If they look reasonable, you can place your thumbs on the side, lift up, and release the lid of the power pack. The lock on the left folds back and the gel can be removed from the apparatus. To open and stain the gel, we use a large pry that is designed specifically for this with a tapering edge. It goes under the top of the gel and we pry from the sides. This breaks the seal and releases the gel. The gel is then stuck on one side and you can see the pattern of the markers relative to this which we use to estimate the size. Then in a small container we place a rapid protein staining gel, staining solution, and place the gel into the stain. You can use a pipette or the spatula again to release the gel from the backing plate and it will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes for the stain to diffuse into the gel and identify all of the protein bands that are there. We 
then ask that you take the gel over to a rocker platform that will assist with moving the gel around so that the staining occurs more rapidly. We'll now move the gel over to the rocker platform and we can observe the, the gel with the bands emerging over the next 10 to 15 minutes. After you've put the stain on top of the gel, we put the gels on a rocker platform to help with the staining through the gel. And it's a rotating platform or in this case a rocking platform. And that moves the gel back and forth and increases the speed of the staining. After about 15 minutes on the rocking platform, the stain will begin to penetrate the gel. We can visualize it. We'll turn off the rocker and remove the stain from the container to a reservoir. And we'll place a rinse on there to take down some of the background staining. After you've aspirated off the protein stain, we can apply a small amount of distilled water that will diffuse into the gel and remove some of the non-specific background staining. After five or 10 minutes, again, we will aspirate that off, and now the gel will be clearer and the bands will be more visible. After pipetting off the distilled water that would diffuse in and remove some of the background staining, you can now see the pre-stained ladder on the left-hand side that go from proteins of high molecular weight to low molecular weight. And you can use the size marker standards to determine what those are. The blue dye front band has been stained yellow by the protein stain. And the lanes are essentially empty of any protein except for this singular band that indicates your fluorescent protein that you purified. You can then determine the size using the standards and by the relative amount and abundance that you see in each lane, you can determine if the concentration and purification matches up with the fractions fluorescence that you saw under the UV light. After transfecting the cells with the green fluorescence protein DNA lipid mixtures, the cells will take up the complex and begin to express the protein after 12 to 18 hours. The expression levels will continue beyond 48 hours and we can determine the levels of expression with the fluorescent cell imager. We can click on the white LED and capture this three different colonies of cells to determine which ones have, if any, have taken up our plasma that are expressing green fluorescence. We can click on the green LED. And now we see cells within two of the three cell clusters that are expressing the green fluorescence protein. Of note is that some of them express strongly and some of them express weakly. And that likely reflects the amount of DNA that those cells took up. So to quantify the success of our cell expression, we can capture an image of the green fluorescence and compare it to the total cells in the field. The way we do that is using a blue stain that penetrates and stains the nucleus. So if we click on the blue LED and refocus the microscope, we now see a blue dot where each cell has the cell nucleus. You will then be asked to download the ImageJ program to quantify these and use that to count the total number of blue nuclei. So the ImageJ system can quantify the blue dots quantify the green expressing cells and that ratio of green to blue will tell you how many cells are expressing your protein of interest. Now we're going to set up the PAGE apparatus to run the gel. PAGE stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And the BME that's already been added to the loading dye denatures the proteins by breaking the disulfide bonds, and then the protein is further denatured and linearized by heat so that they can run through the gel according to accurate size. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to open up your pre-poured gel and take it out. 
And then as you can see on the back, there's a piece of white tape like that. So you just want to remove the piece of tape. to allow the current to flow. And then you're gonna take the lid off. So you wanna put your thumb on the clear part and your fingers underneath and push up to get the lid off. Then you wanna put the gel in so you can read the words. So don't put it in backwards. And then you're just gonna kind of push it in between the two black pieces. And then after that, you're going to fill it with a little more than 400 milliliters of buffer that you can get by the designated station that will be indicated to you by your instructors. All right, so the STS running buffer for the protein gel will be up at the front of the costume where it usually is. So you just want to get 400 milliliters per gel. So if you have two gels running for two people, you want to get 800 milliliters. And once you're done, you can take it back to your bench. Once you have your buffer, you can go ahead and pour it in, and you want to pour it until it reaches that fill line. So you're going to need to pour it in the front and the back, like in front of the gel and behind the gel. And after that, you want to pull the comb out, just like that, and then you can set it to the side. So then, you're going to lock your gel into place by pushing that gray lever forward. And then what you're going to do next is you're going to take up the amount designated in the manual of your different samples and you're going to fill them into the wells in the gel, just like we did in the other gel that we ran previously. All right, so once you're ready to fill your gel, you can go ahead and take up the amount of your sample that it says to in the manual, and then you just wanna carefully pipette it into the wells. So you wanna stabilize your pipette with one hand, holding it with the other, and then you wanna go right up against the back of the gel, and then make sure that you're positioned above one of the wells, and then you can just slowly pipette your sample in and then take your pipette out and then you can fill the rest of the wells. All right, so once you've filled all of your wells, you're just gonna put the lid on. So you wanna position it so each of the little black circles are over these gold bits and you wanna make sure both of the gray levers are up. And then you're just gonna push it down until it locks in. And then you're gonna take the red and black wires and plug them into the power box. All right, and then you just wanna turn it on and then you're gonna set it to 150 volts and let it run for about 45 minutes to an hour. 